if you were to visit Lake Kinneret today, which we also know as the Sea of Galilee, you would find a body of water that is by and large peaceful and serene. There are times, however, that storms suddenly arise over Lake Kinneret, when cold air blows east over the Golan Heights and mixes with the warm air over the lake. As a result, the waters of Lake Kinneret can become quite choppy. And though it is rare that the waters of Kinneret become so turbulent that someone boating on the lake should be concerned for their safety, it does occasionally happen. For instance, in 1992, Israel experienced its worst winter of the 20th century. But some of the worst winter weather came in March of that year, and it came in the form of what is known as the Sharkia. The Sharkia is the name that has been given to the cold, dry east of the wind that sweeps across Israel and normally lasts between 2 and 10 days, and that wind can attain hurricane force. A news article from the Jewish Telegraphic Agency reported that the most serious damage was suffered by Tiberias, which is a, a city there on the lake, and other communities on the shores of Lake Kinneret, as we know again as the Sea of Galilee, where 60 mile per hour winds whipped up six foot waves. And they swept into lakeside restaurants and cafes and flooded the scenic road that parallels the shore. These are the kind of waves that are clearly cause for concern. A storm like this would legitimately be a cause for fear for anyone who happened to be in a boat at the mercy of those wind and waves. But what if you know that in the middle of that storm, one of the people in the boat with you is Jesus? Would the presence of Jesus in the middle of the storm cause your fear to subside? Well, about 2,000 years ago, there was a group of men who found themselves in exactly that situation. As we watch how they respond when they find themselves in the midst of their storm, their response will serve to instruct us how we do respond in the midst of our storms. Let's begin by looking at Luke 8, verse 22. Verse 22 reads, Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. The opening challenge that I want to draw from the word of God this morning is that whatever Jesus says... Obey the words of God. Whatever Jesus says, obey the words of Jesus. What Jesus has just asked his disciples to do was a pretty common occurrence. You probably know that throughout Jesus' early ministry in the northern region of Galilee, Jesus and his disciples would often crisscross what Luke calls the Lake of Gennesaret, or what is now known as Lake Kinneret. We know that several of Jesus' disciples had previously been fishermen, and they had regularly fished on this very lake. Taking a boat across the Lake of Gennesaret would therefore, under normal circumstances, have been a relatively easy task. So when Jesus communicates his desire that they all cross over with him to the other side of the lake, there would have been nothing about Jesus' request that they would have considered to be difficult. But this would not be a routine, a routine crossing of the lake this day. And that's why I've begun with the exhortation for us to obey the words of Jesus, whatever those words may be, because there are times in your life, and there will be times in your life, that in the course of obeying the word of God, a situation will arise suddenly and unexpectedly that broadsides you. There may be times that you are just faithfully seeking to live out the commands of the Lord as a follower of Jesus ought to. 
when something that you did not anticipate springs up seemingly out of nowhere and collides with your life. Because that is exactly what happens with these disciples as they are simply doing what Jesus asked them to do. So whatever Jesus says, obey the words of Jesus. As we were challenged last Sunday, obeying the words of Jesus is what defines the follower of Jesus. Obedience is what sets the one who believes apart from everyone else. But as we continue on to verse 23, we see a second challenge from God's word. Whatever results from your obedience, trust in Jesus. Whatever results from your obedience, trust in Jesus. See here in verse 23, as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. Now, Jesus' disciples were just doing what Jesus said, and look what happened. A storm descended upon the lake, and the boat was quickly taking on water. The Greek word actually should lead us to understand that the boat that they were all in was being completely filled with water. Another word that we often use is, it was being swamped. So when it says that they were in jeopardy, the fact is, they were. Humanly speaking, the the boat was actually coming very near to the point of sinking, and they were in very real danger of losing their lives. Have you ever found yourself broadsided with something while you were seeking to faithfully obey Christ. Have you ever been there? Can you think of an instance in your life where you were just seeking to obey God and something collides with your life? You're seeking to obey Christ by regularly gathering with his people. And I thank you all for being here this morning to gather with his people. It's an act of obedience. You're seeking to obey Christ through acts of love that you are showing to your believing brothers and sisters. You are seeking to obey Christ by taking advantage of opportunities that God gives you to speak the good news of Jesus to others when you find out that you're being let go from your job. You discover that you have stage four cancer. When you discover that your child was just hit by a drunk driver. When tragedy or hardship springs upon you out of nowhere and you are just seeking to follow the Lord, how do you respond? You lose a loved one. Your only means of transportation breaks down. You get badly injured at work or on the roof. What do you do with that? How do you deal with that? Some people respond to tragedy or hardship with anger. They're angry at God or angry at the person responsible for the tragedy or angry at the unfairness that they see in it all. They may keep that anger in so that it turns into bitterness and then hatred. They may turn that anger out on someone else. Some people respond with anger. Others might respond to tragedy or hardship with agony. Perhaps you've been there. It just hurts so much. I just want it all to stop. I just can't take it anymore. I just want to escape all the pain that I'm feeling right now in life. And people try to escape it. People may seek to escape it through alcohol or through drugs. Some even go to the extreme of seeking to escape it through suicide. But another way that a person might respond to tragedy or hardship is by being afraid. And as we come to 
verse 24, we discover that exactly how Jesus' own disciples respond to the situation they have suddenly found themselves in. The disciples of Jesus are fearing for their very lives. They come to Jesus here in verse 24, right? Jesus is sleeping there in the boat. How he can sleep in the middle of the storm, I don't know. But they come to him and they wake him up and say, Master, Master, we are perishing. They don't just come up and say, Hey, hey, Jesus, when you got a moment, we have a little issue over here. No, he, they're saying, We are going to die. And they believed him. Let me ask you something. Was their fear a reasonable fear? <laughs> Have you, what would you say if you were in their shoes? Would you say that it is reasonable to fear drowning when your boat is filling with water in a storm? I mean, if you're in the middle of a large lake and you're caught in a storm and your boat is quickly filling with water, isn't it reasonable for you to be afraid of that situation? It's very reasonable. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that water has the potential of drowning someone. They didn't have flotation devices. They didn't have a coast guard that they could radio. Their ship was just moments away from being completely filled with water and they were all on their own. Except they weren't. Were they? There was someone else in the boat with them. But in the midst of their fearful situation, they allowed the fear of their surrounding circumstances to blind them to the significance of the one who was right there with them. All that the disciples were focusing on in that moment was the wind and the waves. And that is the reason they awoke the sleeping Jesus. They awoke him because they believed that the wind and the waves were about to send them to their death. So as we mentioned before, their fear, humanly speaking, was reasonable. Anyone in their situation would likely respond the way they did. But just because their fear was reasonable, does that mean that it was acceptable? Does that mean that their fear was right? Let's look at what happens next and we'll discover the answer. And Jesus, of course, he arises. And what does he do? Jesus rebukes the wind and the raging of the water. He talks to them. And they cease. And there was calm. And notice what Jesus says next. What does he say? Where is your faith? According to Jesus, was his disciples' fear right? Was his disciples' fear acceptable? Did he give them a pass because of their fear? Oh, I know you're just human, so I understand. Is that what he said? That's not what he said. Why was their fear not acceptable? Because they should have known that they could trust Jesus based on the authority he has demonstrated over everything else. What have we seen Jesus do? I mean, you just go back through Luke's gospel that we've looked at week after week after week for quite some time now. In fact, you look back in Luke chapter 4, Jesus has already demonstrated his authority over diseases and disabilities. In Luke chapter 4, recall how Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Scripture tells us that Jesus actually rebuked the fever, and the fever left. 
At the word of Jesus, the sickness fled. Jesus has also demonstrated his authority over the demonic world. Again, in Luke chapter 4, you see that at the word of Jesus, demons came out of many. Jesus also demonstrated his authority over the animal kingdom. You come to Luke chapter 5, and Peter and his friends, they've been fishing all night long, and they've caught nothing. What does Jesus say? Go back out there. Try again. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Remember how Peter responded? He said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And the number of fish that they caught was so great that Simon Peter called James and John and their boat over to his, and they filled both of their boats to the point that both of them were beginning to sink. Don't forget Luke 7, verse 7, where the word of Jesus was responsible for raising up the sick servant of a centurion from the brink of death. And don't forget Luke 7, 14, where Jesus speaks to the corpse of a widow's only son, and her dead son was raised from death itself. The disciples of Jesus should have recalled these things that they had seen and heard, and they should have had the confidence that the one whose word could heal the sick and restore the maimed and cast out demons and control animals and raise the dead. The disciples of Jesus should have had the confidence that the authority of the words of Jesus could be brought to bear even on their current situation. Jesus hasn't changed. He hasn't become powerless. He's the same one that they've seen do all these miracles. Yet they forgot. They lost sight of who Jesus was. Instead, Jesus' disciples demonstrated a lack of trust in Jesus. A lack of faith in the one who has done all these things who has proved his authority again and again that he is master of all these things. And they forgot. The wind and the waves were too great for their sight. Their attention was completely focused on the ferocity of the storm, and they were wrong to do so. Because the one who was on the boat going through the storm with them was not just any man. And this brings us to the final challenge I'd like for us to draw from God's word this morning. Trust in Jesus because of who he is. You saw Jesus do what Jesus did. What would be your reaction? You know what the disciples reacted like? Verse goes on to say here, they were afraid and they marveled and they said to one another, who can this be? The Greek literally reads, Who then, as a result of what they have just seen, who then is this? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Friends, no longer is the disciples afraid of the storm. Fear of the storm has been replaced by a fear of something else. The disciples of Jesus are afraid because they now stand in the presence of someone who has just controlled the storms with his words. My friend, who alone has the authority to command the winds and the water? It's the same one who spoke the wind and the water into existence. And it will not be long before the disciples of Jesus finally come to realize Jesus 
and see him for who he really is. I can only imagine that at least some of them are beginning to awaken to the realization that the teacher they have chosen to follow is none other than God himself. And if Jesus is God, then Jesus is worthy of our trust. Jesus is worthy of our faith. Friends, I believe the point of our passage today is clear. And it is this. If Jesus is with you, you can trust him because of who he is. There is no circumstance that you might face in this life in which this isn't the case. Because of who Jesus is, you can trust him even with your very life. This is the lesson the disciples of Jesus learned that day in the midst of the storm. They learned that in the midst of the storm, Jesus was with them. They learned in the midst of the storm, it didn't matter. If he was asleep, Jesus was with them. There was no need to fear the wind and the waves because their master, the master of the wind and the waves themselves, was right there in the boat with them. Which brings us back to the important question that we need to ask ourselves today. Is Jesus in the boat with you? Is Jesus in the boat with you? As you seek to live a life of obedience to the word of God, you need to be prepared with the knowledge that you will inevitably find yourself in the midst of a sudden tempest. There will be trials that spring into your life seemingly out of nowhere, and it will be very easy for you to despair. It will be very easy for you to give up. It will be very easy for you to think that this tragedy or this trial will be your undoing. But if you're a follower of Jesus, I have news for you. All is not lost. Because who is it that is in the boat with you? It's Jesus. Is that not the promise that Jesus made to his disciples before he returned to the Father? You're familiar with Matthew 28? What's the last words that Jesus said? He says, Lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It says in John's Gospel, A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you, my disciples, will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? To them, to the saints, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he who is in you is greater than what? Than he who is in the world. My friend, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, there is no circumstance that you will ever face that you must face without Jesus. Not even death. Because as a follower of Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Friend, does the Spirit of God dwell in you? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he does. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, 
The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, you who raised, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Friend, even death is not final for the Christian. Even death will be overcome because it has been overcome in the body of Jesus Christ. So who then is this Jesus that you follow? Do you understand fully who Jesus is? Is there any situation that is too difficult for Jesus to rescue you from? What's the answer? No. Is there any situation too difficult for Jesus to carry you through? What's the answer? No. So are you, Christian, living in fear of the tempests that are going on around us? Are you living in fear because you don't know what will happen to our nation? Are you living in fear because of the wickedness that is being given free reign? Are you living in fear because evil is being called good and good is being called evil? Are you living in fear that your financial situation is looking more and more unstable? Or are you trusting the master of the wind and the waves in the midst of the storms in your life? Have you placed your life in his safekeeping? Are you seeking to obey him no matter what the outcome of the obedience is? Because friends, even when we obey, we're still going to face the storm. You're still going to go through the trial. Hardship is still going to broaden you out of nowhere. Are you ready to continue in obedience regardless of what happens? Are you trusting him even though you right now are feeling like you are floundering? Like the ship is going down because friend, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he's got you. The reality is, because of who Jesus is, Jesus will hold fast to those who are holding fast to him. He has the authority to do so. He has the power to do so. And my friend, he has given us his word that he will do so. As he says in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. The disciples needed to realize on that boat that if Jesus was with them, if Jesus was indeed keeping them safe, they would never perish. Neither shall anyone and we might add for the disciples' benefit, neither shall anything snatch them out of Jesus' hands. So let me encourage you this morning. Fear not the wind and the waves of the storm, because their master is in the boat with you. Will you rest in that? Will you believe that? Will you trust the master of the storms? Let's pray. Our Father, there are some in this room who are going through difficult and grievous trials. Lord, certainly look around us, our nation is in the midst of a storm. But Father, as we have seen in your word, we can trust you 
And we do not have to be afraid of the storm. Father, would you encourage your people through your word today that if our faith is in Jesus, we need fear nothing, not even death itself, because you have us. You are holding us. You are keeping us fast. Lord, help us to trust what your word is saying right now. And let us take our eyes off of the wind and waves that are swirling all around us and keep our eyes fixed on their master. We pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.